Uh, to Le Grand Macabre is probably the most successful of all late 20th century operas, particularly as measured by the number of productions and theatres where it's been staged in the 35 years since it was premiered in Stockholm. In fact, um, it must be at least 40 opera houses on four continents who see the Grand Macabre, and now, of course, Oslo. Well, that's due in part to the theatricality of the piece, which is very striking, and that it's very strongly characterised, vividly depicted characters, and um, also, of course, that it's a narrative that keeps you wanting to know what happens next. And it's also entertaining, or it should be, um, but we have to bear in mind that humour doesn't always translate between languages and between cultures. But it is supposed to be entertaining, and so if you think there's opportunity to laugh, please do. <laughs> and although the exchanges between the characters, especially in scenes one and two, are partly dramatised in a sort of heightened parlando, as we say in musical terms, which means a sort of um, highly charged conversation set to music. There are also um, some wonderful passages of musical inspiration, and more so in the second act as the piece progresses. Well, in the first four years after the premiere, there were no less than seven productions in five languages, each with a different director. It's typical of Ligeti's meticulous approach to everything that he did that um, he visualized a very precisely detailed scenario, a very special stage picture, and describes it minutely in the score. And it's also typical of the modern fashion for director's theater and director's opera that um, many have imposed their own quite alien interpretations, none more so than the celebrated American director, Peter Sellers, who was engaged for the premiere of Ligeti's revised version of the opera at the Salzburg Festival in 1996. And so completely did Peter Sellers um, disregard Ligeti's scenario and introduce a completely different one, that Ligeti, who was um, terribly distressed when he realized what was happening, um, demanded that Salzburg cancel the whole production or performance it. Well, such things are not really realistic in um, the extremely expensive business of mounting festivals, but agonized by the banality of the production as he saw it and what he regarded as a betrayal of his vision. When the production went to Paris, which is where I first saw it, and was simply agonized actually, Ligeti refused to go into the theatre and really listened to the recording van. Well, the challenge of staging the Grand Macabre is that it's set in an imaginary royal land, and, um, it, which evokes the paintings of Peter Bruegel, the elder, elder, with their penetrating and satirical depictions of humanity, as well as of the slightly earlier artist, Hieronymus Bosch, who one dictionary I was looking at described as perhaps the greatest master of fantasy who ever lived. The Grand Macabre, as well as Ligeti's Requiem, were influenced by two very specific paintings which Ligeti saw in the Prado in Madrid in 1961. That's the Triumph of Death by Peter Bruegel. And, um, looked at in detail. It's a pretty horrific painting. You'll notice there's an oven on the right there, and humanity is entering it, and it's actually a very prescient paper pa painting of the um, terrible events of the 20th century and after. This is a detail. See if there's a 
better. And here's another detail from the bottom right of the picture, which shows how um, finely the whole painting is wrought. And in the very self-same small room is this one, which is The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, the triptych. On the left we see God with Adam and Eve. In the middle we see people don't, um, the authorities don't quite know how to interpret it. Perhaps it's an idealised paradise. On the right is hell, extraordinary. There we see one of the images which perhaps has inspired tonight's production. No production out of the more than 30 has yet recreated the old Flemish iconography that was in Ligeti's mind and which he would like to have seen on stage. Arguably, however, the stage picture should allude at least in part to Bruegel and Bosch um, and their portrayal of the grotesque, um, of the surreal, of the magical and also particularly mortality. And ideally, as I said before, it should be funny. And certainly at some moments, it should be visionary and awe-inspiring, posing the question, is this really the end of the world, Le Grand Macabre, the terrible weeper, or is he an imposter? Well, it's an opera of contrasts. Some scenes are lewd, bordering on pornography, and others reflective. At the heart, the opera is really a black comedy about the fear of dying, with a cast of exaggerated caricatures of great variety. So any staging, like Peter Sellers, that is fundamentally rather abstract, and particularly if it's conceived in static tableau, fails to communicate the quirky volatility of the piece, or to illuminate its richness of detail and incident. Well, there have been some productions, about two, which Lichty actually liked, Foremost was in Bologna only one year after the premiere because of its many visual delights and the rather surreal, wonderful sets, as he said, by the French artist and filmmaker Roland Tobler. Although neither Bosch nor Bruegel, Nicky thought it retained their essence. It was also actually the most pornographic, he said, and also the most cartoon-like, which Nicky favoured. A picture here of the front curtain design. These are from um, 1979, so, so they're not colour. Um, that is the stage design for the second scene, about which I'll say a little bit more later. There's a great telescope at the back. It might look like something else it was intended to. Um, this is Prince Gogo, -Go, the very fat and um, uh, Latimus boy who appears in scene three. These are his two principal ministers, the black and the white ministers, who are constantly throwing insults at each other, but whose policies are exactly the same. Um, this is the production from Paris, which Ligeti hated, because it was about the end of opera, rather than the end of the world, which was not what he wrote about, and also the director chose to triplicate all of the characters to the great confusion of the audience. And that's the one scene from the production we're seeing tonight, and I'm not giving too much away by just showing you one, because there is uh, an image on the outside of the Opera House which gives you some idea, but I think you can see the connection with certainly Hieronymus Bosch, the two actors in the eyes of this enormous think on stage, you'll see it later. Well, as I say, I think the production that we're going to see tonight, Ligeti actually might rather have liked, certainly because it's visually very striking. Ligeti's Requiem and the opera uh, both deal with mortality, but from different standpoints. The Requiem is um, intensely serious. The opera, um, an entertaining satire, which verges on slapstick. More deeply, however, both works grew out of the vivid, often disorientating and often very frightening experiences of Ligeti's early life in Hungary. Um, as a small child, 
he began to imagine music to accompany the daily routines. And when he was a little older, he invented a fictitious country, which he called Kilveria, with its own language, its grammar, and its system of government and judiciary. Let me just, before showing you that, show you a little bit of the mature Ligeti. There, there's Ligeti in his prime. Uh, here he is at a rehearsal with their um, escapade Salomon. Terribly fussy, a nightmare to have at rehearsals. Claudio Abbado um, refused to have him at his rehearsals. <laughs> here he is listening. <laughs> Here he is in the post-mortem after a rehearsal. <laughs> and here he is when he came to the Huddersfield Festival talking to the audience. He was very charismatic and he could be utterly charming and he had no airs. <laughs> this is Kilveria, this imaginary country that he invented in his early teens, one of many maps of it. A good many children draw things like this, but that one's rather special. When he was seven, the, um, oh, it's worth mentioning also that he fell in love with the Lewis Carroll books, Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. And um, he loved the nonsensical, nonsensical imagination of Lewis Carroll, and he revered them all his life. He had a long ambition to write an opera, a second opera on Alice in Wonderland, but alas, um, it was never composed. When he was only seven, he moved to the um, Transylvanian capital, Cluj, or Kolosvar as it was in Hungary. And um, he was invited to attend the opera performances there, in the regional opera house, um, accompanying a rather older cousin, whose mother paid for both their tickets. And he was utterly entranced, this small boy, by the splendor of the surroundings, the drama, the music, the stage illusions, <coughs> even, of course, by the sweets they shared. The first opera he saw was actually Boris Godunov, with its tremendous coronation scene and pealing bells, and Ligeti recalled it as one of the greatest, greatest experiences of his childhood. But he also loved the classic repertoire of Monteverdi, Mozart and Verdi, and he never dismissed the operatic genre as multiband and irrelevant, as famously Boulez did in many of the avant-garde. And in fact, for all its subversive satire, you'll find that Le Grand Macabre contains many affectionate echoes of that heritage. Although mainly composed in the 1970s and premiered in 1978, it was, of course, commissioned in the swinging 60s, and it's perhaps influenced by that liberating, exhilarating, riotous, convention-busting decade with its sexual permissiveness, street demonstrations in Paris, a nuclear arms race between America and Russia, and a very real fear of annihilation. And I'm old enough, possibly some of you are, to remember that one was fearful. It was also, however, the decade of Bob Dylan and the Beatles, of psychedelic <coughs> music, of flower power, of avant-garde cinema, like the works of um, Ingmar Bergman, which Ligeti knew, abstract art, pop art, happenings, John Cage, and the absurdist theatre of UNESCO and Beckett. Well, Ligeti warmed to all these novelties and contributed himself in two short works of rather subversive music theatre called Aventure and Nouvelle Aventure, some of you might know, which have phonetic texts that have no meaning, no, no understandable dialogue, um, and there are no actual words, but they simulate exaggerated emotions that the singers command and cajole and wheedle and take offence and gossip and chatter conspiratorially and there's a chronically neurotic soprano who has a grand hysterical scene. Well, for his full-length opera, Ligeti planned something similar, similarly nonsensical, um, which he thought would be crazy and demonic and humorous. It was going to be set in Kildare, this fantasy land he'd invented as a teenager. But then he thought that in a full-length opera you needed some storytelling, 
So he toyed with the send-up of the Oedipus myth, using actors and acrobats and midgets. And he hoped that the New York, that the Romanian-born New York, New York um, cartoonist Saul Steinberg would design the sets, though he never got around to asking him, but if he had, they might have looked something like this. And this is Egypt in quieter times than now. And this he calls um, inventory. And this is one of the front covers of the New Yorker, which he regularly illustrated. However, um, Nicky was now teaching in Hamburg at the Conservatoire, and he was also fulfilling commissions. He didn't get down to starting the opera until um, the mid-70s, really, by which time things had moved on. Um, in 1970, um, a theatre piece was staged by another iconoclastic avant-garde composer, namely the Argentinian Mauricio Cargo. It was called Stutz Theatre. People who are in the world of new music know it as a, um, a part of the legend. Um, it was produced at Hamburg State Opera, but it was so unlike anything an opera might be expected to contain that it's acquired a certain mythology, um, especially it was only ever produced once. This too had no story, had no dramatic roles, it had no decor. The music didn't accompany action, it actually was the action. Um, it was a sort of instrumentally, instrumental and gestural piece in which anything that produced sound had also to be seen. This is a section called Season, you can see as sort of a little drawings of what sort of things going on on stage. Here's another one. This depicts a, a man with drums all over him it's up there as well. And there's very minimal actual notation. Here's, here's a picture of what was on stage. Well, um, Ligeti saw this and um, was immensely impressed like everybody else it quickly became labelled an anti-opera. And since it would be very hard to match, let alone surpass it, Ligeti decided that his own rejection of convention would have to be an anti-opera, since two antis cancel each other out, it would be opera. <laughs> and um, that actually suited Ligeti rather well. Opera has quite a lot of baggage, and actually Ligeti was quite fond of the baggage. Um, it was not so much a retreat from the avant-garde as a nimble sidestep which allowed him to indulge his childhood memories of all the um, high points in uh, opera that he'd enjoyed and also send them up, I mean, make fun of them. Still, no subject had yet been decided upon and in the early 70s the production team met to reconsider and it was at this stage that the suggestion was made, actually it had been made before, of um, the, um, a, a play by this rather obscure uh, Belgian dramatist, Michel de Gellerota, called La Ballade de Grand Macabre. Um, it had the attraction of being set in an imaginary royal land, which Dickety uh, was very familiar with the iconography, and um, it invited allusions to other paintings by Bosch, of course, to Marguerite, and also by James Ensor. This is a drawing of his, of death, doing his business. <coughs> so um, that's what they took. It um, also had references to absurdist theatre. And the result is a sort of allegorical dance of death as performed in medieval morality plays, which Ligeti fakes music that reminds us of things we've heard before. Perhaps we don't quite recognise what. Um, but it's still a thoroughly modern opera. Um, these are the characters you meet in the first scene. First of all, Amando and Amanda. Amanda and Amanda. Soprano, the soprano and a mezzo soprano. But should be young, very beautiful lovers, as in a Botticelli painting, says Ligeti. Um, certainly, Peter Sellers gave no indication of 
not the cherry at all. But um, you can see what Lindsay had in mind, the famous birth of Venus, Botticelli, and that's a panel out of Primavera Spring. I won't deal with the myth, but you can see the character of the ladies. Only one production, I think, um, suggests that. This was, um, well, there are probably more. That's actually from Zurich, and I think 1992, Amanda and Amanda in metrotome, Metronome is a reference to Lincoln's interest in clocks ticking. We have Nefotza, a sinister, shady, demagogic figure, humorous, pretentious, with an unshakable sense of mission, says Lickety. Is he dead? Or is he a charlatan? And Piet the Pot, who's caught and constantly inebriated, and enters with a bottle in his hand and has it for most of the opera. Um, and um, he's a sort of Sasha Panzo from um, Don Quixote, sidekick to the Croxa. That's a picture from the um, Flanders Opera production from 2001, I think, but they're often represented in very different ways. Then here is scene two. In scene two, um, we have a chaotic combination of observatory, laboratory, and kitchen. Um, in his CD notes, Ligeti describes this um, it's as an indescribable mess of this chaotic combination of observatory, laboratory, and kitchen. There's telescope, measuring devices, astrological charts, folios, and preparations are all jumbled together with kitchen gadgets, dirty laundry, and leftover food. Everything is covered with cobwebs. Well, that's a compression of what Ligeti actually writes in the score. It's in the vocal score, maybe it's just left for me, which is far, far more detailed and quite elaborate. The, scene, the music between scenes one and scene two is quite short, and Ligeti, recognising this, suggests that the second scene should be set behind the first. Well, for any stage designer, that's quite a serious constraint, and one can understand why it's nearly always rejected. Scene three is the longest, comes after the interval, and um, leads to the climax of the opera, really. Um, oh, I, there's a prelude for six electric doorbells, but I forgot to mention that at the beginning of scene one, we have a prelude for car horns, <laughs> rather famously, which we hear again between scene one and two. And this is for six electric doorbells. And then there's action, well, supposedly in the score, in front of the curtain, when we have these um, two ministers, the white minister and the black minister, um, whose dialogue is, is abusive, um, worse than um, Australian politics. <laughs> I'm sure yours would be highly decorous in the day or two. Um, they, uh, they appear with Prince Gogo, who is this fat, gluttonous, infantile boy who they tyrannise. Um, there is a wonderful entry for the chief of the secret political police, Gepopo, who is, um, comes from those three words, Coloratoro Soprano. It's a dazzling part to sing. In fact, Ligeti has extracted it, it's been extracted as a concert piece. Oh, it's very effective indeed. So, but she should appear disguised as, as a fantastic bird of prey. She enters on roller skates, and <coughs> followed by detectives, torturers and executioners who snoop around with great agility. Um, it's a stunning part and very, very challenging to bring off. Um, so, uh, and the music, um, uh, Ligeti reveled in writing this because he'd experienced the secret police twice over, both in Nazi Germany and in um, communist Hungary. And it's full of psts, yes, nervous. She's terribly nervous, the chief of the secret police, um, who surprised me. Um, and then we have um, 
This offstage chorus, also earlier in the piece, they first represent the whispering walls in this scene, which are part of de Popo's um, imaginings. And then the people of Broiderland, um, and the Kroxer has spied a comet, which he um, uh, is going to assist him in bringing to the end, uh, the end of the world. Um, there's then a grandiose entrance of Necroxa and his fiendish entourage, <coughs> who should appear, ideally, through the auditorium from all, um, all entrance, but it depends, of course, on the theatre and that works. And um, this is Jeff riding on Piet, waving his scythe and blowing his trumpet. That's from the Zurich production. And then we get to the last scene, which is quite short. Um, there's a, a wonderful orchestral transformation between what might or might not be the end of the world and then this rather idyllic, lovely country of Freudland with that in. Um, there's Piet, Astrid de Mors, and Prince Gogo. Three ruffians appear, as they do. Um, and then the crops are the white and black ministers. But the crops are, is um, very, um, uh, very, very subdued and disappointed because he's obviously failed. And uh, there's also another rather wonderful bit of music for strings called, a, which is a mirror of cannon, during which he gradually shrivels, diminishes to a sphere, and disappears into the earth. Um, I've never seen that illusion quite produced on stage, but it's a nice idea. Finally, there is um, a passacaglia in which Amanda and Amanda, who have um, found their, their hidey hole in the grave in scene one, um, and stayed there during the end of the world, and come out again still professing their love. And they then are joined by the rest of the cast, except the crops have disappeared, um, and they sing a final moral, fear not to die good people all, no one knows when his hour will fall, and when it comes then let it be, farewell till then in cheerfulness. Um, it's a moral like there is at the end of Don Giovanni, Mozart, and also at the end of Falstaff at Berlin, also at the end of Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress. That's not the only reference to Berlin. Um, we're not playing anything on the loudspeakers because it'll sound much more impressive than the wonderful acoustics of your opera house. Um, but um, in the first scene, there's a moment when <coughs> Necrops uh, very portentously announces the end of the world and um, that what he's about to, to bring to, 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 to happen on the 12th stroke of midnight. And the music actually is it refers to Falstaff's, the last scene of that is Falstaff, where Falstaff thinks he's got an assignation in the forest at midnight. In fact, he's going to be ambushed and uh, made fun of. But um, he arrives in the forest and the clock strikes 12. And there's a wonderful passage because he, he counts out each strike on the same note and Verdi has to make a different chord for each note, like this. Um, Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque. They're not playing anymore, or maybe they'll be cross with me. I played this when I gave a talk in English National Opera. My daughter said to me afterwards, you've now put on your CV that you've sung at English National Opera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I wish you joy of the opera. There's a lot to take in. Do try and keep an eye on the surtitles. Um, he took a lot of trouble over the um, trying to, to write bad German and doggerel, and it can be quite funny. And um, no time for questions, but we'll be wandering around in the interval, so if anybody wants to ask anything or make a comment, please do. Enjoy.